Very often when I speak about Depeche Mode in my videos, I mention the day I met Martin Gore. And a lot of you have asked me to speak about that. So, let's get into it. Hi guys, and welcome to Piano and Keyboard Artist where we discuss the artists related to pianos, keyboards, and synthesizers. And today is a different type of video. Today is a very personal story. Today we're going to talk about the day I met Martin L. Gore. Now, if you've been following my channel for a while and been watching my Depeche Mode album review series, you will know that I have every now and then spoken about how I met Martin Gore once. And that has prompted a lot of you to ask me, Vaughan, could you please tell us the story in detail? And I keep saying, yeah, I'll talk about it. But I thought, let me actually just do a video and talk about it because as, as time goes by, our memory tends to fade. But this I can remember very, very vividly. Um, we are talking about 20 years ago when this happened. So I have actually said on my videos that I met him in was it the year 2000 or 2001? But now upon reflection and sort of trying to get my facts right, bearing in mind it was 20 years ago, I think it was the year 2000. Now, in order to make the story as authentic as possible, I'm going to have to give you a little bit of background on my story. And uh, as you know, I on these videos, it's all about the content. I never speak about myself, but I'm gonna give you a little bit of uh, background here. So I came to the UK in 1999. Um, it was June, the end of June 1999. Um, so I essentially started the millennium here in the UK. So it was June 1999. And, you know, I came from a very small conservative mining town in South Africa, which was called Stillfontein, which to you means quiet fountain. I mean, it's a tiny town, blink and you'll miss it. Um, it's the, the the town has really suffered now. It's really in depression now ever since the gold mines closed and everything. But anyway, back in those days, I decided to move to the UK because I have you know British ancestry, and I just it was like an irresistible pull of my roots. I wanted to come and see you know where my my origins and my DNA came from, so to speak. Um, now, growing up, Depeche Mode was always very very important to me, uh, as you guys know. Ever since I heard "Enjoy the Silence" the first time my life was never the same. It ignited something in me that has brought me to where I am now. And every the reason I am where I am now is because of Depeche Mode. And I will never forget the moment I heard Enjoy the Silence for the first time. But, so I came to the UK and it was funny, when I got onto that plane for the first time, I had never been on a plane in my life. You know, as I say, we had a very humble background. Didn't have any money, you know, my parents did the best they could to provide for us and my parents are amazing, I love them to bits. Um, but, you know, we, we never had money, you know, we always had like a shitty car and, but, you know, but our clothes were always clean and my parents just were, uh, looked after us so well. So, anyway, I don't want to get too soppy now, but by the time I got to the UK, that was the first time I had actually climbed onto a plane. I'd never been on a plane before. So the reason I'm telling you this is because I think it is important for you to know how humble my, my you know, my background was. I was from a conservative mining town. Uh, you know, I was not a city kid. I was very innocent and, and quite naive. Um, but I did have this introverted nature where I would lock myself in a room and I would, you know, I lost myself in music. I taught myself how to play instruments. And while my friends were going out and getting drunk and partying, I was, you know, learning how to make records. I used to work in a supermarket to fund, um, you know, to get the money to be able to buy keyboards and stuff. And I remember friends coming to me one day and saying, looking at all my equipment and going, wow, you should sell all this and you can buy a car, you know, you can go out and chase the chicks. Well, I mean, I chased chicks a, a, a lot later in my life, but at that time I was just a bit of a, a geek. I just wanted to, you know, get into my music. And Depeche Mode were very important. I, in fact, I learned how to play music by watching VHS recordings of 101 and Live in Hamburg. I would sit on the floor with a keyboard and, and you know, I'd, I'd, I'd pause in slow motion. I'd, I'd watch them playing. That's how I learned. But anyway, so I think I've drawn 
a, a very vivid picture of how humble and, and you know, modest my upbringing was. So for me to come from this very modest, humble environment and to get off a plane in London, which is one of the most vibrant center of the world as far as music and all of this concerned, I had walked into a whirlwind. And when I got here, um, I did some bar work and everything, but I found myself a job in a music retail store called Turnkey. Now this was in uh, Charing Cross Road, and I remember I remember it well. Um, fortunately for me at the time, I was actually living in Oxford Street in a pub, so it you know so it was just walking distance. And Turnkey, I can tell you stories about this. Um, it was a it was a tough place to work. Um, all the staff that worked there were sort of, you know, musicians, producers, and it was a very difficult job because what made it very difficult was the fact that they paid you so little, you know, um, they had different departments, you know, sales and, and, you know, engineers and things like that, technical departments, but you as the salesman got paid really badly. You basically got a basic salary, which was very little, not even enough to get by on. And then your salary was made up by sales. So if you didn't make sales, you would essentially not be able to pay your rent. It was that cutthroat. And this kind of filtered into the turnkey thing where customer services became very bad because if a customer came in and wanted to, um, you know, wanted customer services, you were very uh, conscious of the fact that if if I spend too much time with this customer, I'm not going to make sales. And if I don't make sales, I don't make money. If, and if I don't make money, I can't pay my rent. So it was, a, you know, we it had entered into the, the vicious circle. But I can't say anything bad about Turnkey. I had some great years there. As I say, I started off as a salesman and then I became the purchaser. And the, you know, the owners and the, the management of Turnkey personally were very good to me, even when I was ill once um, my salary got topped up. So I've got nothing bad to say about them. But this is important that you know this because for the, the Martin Gore story that's coming now is understand the environment. It was very, it was very cutthroat. You had to work very hard to, to sell. And, and, and I'm not a pushy person, so I don't like to like force sales upon people, but you, you, you did become quite pushy. Anyway, I can tell you many stories, and in fact, this should probably be a, a several part story. But now I remember this was summer in the year 2000, must have been around July because the weather was nice. And I remember coming from the office. Now, Turnkey had a, uh, a showroom or a floor, you know, like a demonstration room on the, on, on the shop floor on, you know, on Charing Cross Road. And then if you walk down the alley, down the back, they had a you know, the offices, and that's where we used to do tele sales. And because I was a salesman, I would, you know, be on the phone, you know, trying to sell equipment. And then, of course, I would sometimes have to go to the shop to demonstrate products because I was known as the keyboards guy. Um, I knew fuck all back in those days, but I could play. So um, that did help me when I used to sell keyboards. I could demonstrate, and that helped me sell. So I never forget it was uh, July. It was in the summer of 2000, and I was having a pretty bad day. Um, I, I think we were coming to the middle of the month. I had made very little sales, and I was very stressed to know that, okay, I'm probably not going to be able to make my rent this month, and that's how dramatic it was. And then, <laughs> by, you know, when all the stars lined up and luck was there for you, I remember walking down the, the alley to the front of, of, of the store, just kind of walking in a daze, you know, just thinking of all the shit I had to do. And I walked up to the front door of the shop. And at this very moment, this man walks up to me. I look at him. Oh my fucking God. <laughs> it's Martin Al Gore. <laughs> okay. You know, I never used to drink in those days. So I just thought I was hallucinating because the initial seeing him was just so... You know, it's very strange. When you see someone that you recognize, your, you know, your brain kind of goes, oh, I know this person, obviously. But it's a very surreal situation where you, you're looking at someone that you know, or you think you know, but they don't know you. And of course, when I grew up, I had posters of Depeche Mode in my room. You know, it was, I had slogans of them. I was, you know, so, so for years, I'd be lying in bed or you know, as you go to sleep, you've got the posters on the wall and you're looking at the posters, you wake up in the morning and you see the posters. So you recognize those faces, you know, their faces were kind of etched into your consciousness and they were just so important to me because 
you know, I phew, they got me into music and my God. So I'm standing at the front of the shop there and there's this person that you recognize. And my God, it was Martin Gore. And I never forget. I just looked at him like this and he kind of looked at me and then I pulled the, the shop door open and he went, cheers. And he walked in and I went, <laughs> and then what followed, I've never really told this story before in, in so much detail, but then what followed, I really made a hell of a, I really made a fool of myself. I did redeem myself, but initially I made such a fool of myself. So Martin walks into the shop and he walks straight over to the keyboard sections, obviously, and he's just walking around. And one of the first things I noticed was, you know, there were quite a few people in, in the shop floor and no one really sort of recognized him more. And I thought to myself, okay, two things. It's Martin Gore. Screw, screw you guys. He's mine. I'm talking to him. No one else. Guys, I sprinted into the shop. The first thing I did, I remember running past the counter because we had a, you know, a sales counter. I grabbed a piece of note paper from a, you know, a telephone notepad. I grabbed that, grabbed a pen, ran straight to Martin Gore. And I went, oh, Martin Gore, Martin Gore. Oh my God. <laughs> So embarrassing, so embarrassing. I would have never reacted like that now. But as as I said in the beginning of the video, if you, if, if you just look at my background and, you know, the small town boy coming to the city and just, oh my God, it's Martin Gore. And as I ran up to him and I went, Martin Gore, Martin Gore, Martin Gore. And I never forget like putting this pen and paper in his face. Like, please, please, I'm, I'm your biggest fan. Please, can I have your autograph? You know, just really that intense. And I, you know, I'm not a very excitable person in that way. I can usually restrain myself, but I think this was the, I, I, I freaked out. And I never forget, he took the piece of paper from me. He took the pen and he went, and he kind of gave it to me like this. Cause he was, his reaction was a bit like, <laughs> which is understandable. And he went, and I went, thank you. Thank you. And he went, and then he kind of just walked away. And I thought, Fuck. And then I sort of walked off and just off where the keyboards were, there was like a glass door, which you could go through. And that glass door was where we kept all the speakers, you know, for demoing and, you know, showing people speakers and stuff. So I walked in there, closed the door and I was like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. I mean, I was, I was fucking freaked out. Honestly, you won't believe it. And then I took some deep breaths and I thought, okay, compose yourself, Vaughn, compose yourself. Yeah, because I wouldn't want one of my idols to think I was a nutter. Not that he'd care because, I mean, he meets so many people. Anyway, and then I saw him sort of, once I'd calmed down, I was like looking through the glass, you know, and I was steaming up the glass. I must have looked like a fucking pervert. <laughs> I wasn't rubbing my thighs, I can promise you, but I was so fanboyed out. And, and then I saw him sort of walking around the keyboards and he was putting headphones on, you know, he was like trying the keyboards. And then I saw someone else coming into the shop um, and walked up to him, which um, was obviously a friend of his. I don't know who the guy was, but he was very tall. I mean, I'm six feet tall, and this guy was about a head taller than me, so he was about six feet, six feet three or six feet four. He was a very big guy, and looking back at it now, I think he was probably not a security guard or a bodyguard. Um, the chemistry that Martin had with this guy would suggest to me that they were friends, um, but I think with Martin, I think... I think when you're going to go out into the city, it's always good to have someone with you. You know, he's a very shy guy. And this guy was pretty big. You wouldn't mess with him. Anyway, so this tall guy walked in, went up to Martin, and I thought, okay, Vaughn, do it for the people. Do it for the people of your small town. And I, deep breath, opened the door, walked out, walked straight up to them. And I said, Mr. Mr. Gore, I'd just like to apologize to you. Sorry about that. I've just been, you are the reason I got into music. I'm a huge fan, but I understand that you are here to, uh, you know, cause you're looking at gear. How may I, my, how may I help you, sir? And then I just turned it on and I just, and that was completely calm. Although my heart was racing and everything inside, I was so calm. And then Martin went, oh, okay. And then the tall guy who was with Martin started speaking for Martin. And I thought, oh God, are you, are you playing Fletcher's role here? And the guy went, yes, um, Martin's just interested in some of the, you know, some new gear. Is there anything you can recommend? And I thought, fuck yeah, <laughs> there's a lot I can recommend. Not only is one of my idols standing here, but I can also make some sales now. And But uh, I'll be honest with you, um, when he was standing there, 
Um, the last thing in my mind was, I'm going to sell this guy lots of equipment, you know, to make up my sales quota for the month. That was the last thing in my mind. I was just so, you can tell, even by telling the story, it's it, it, it's it's really exciting. But now, times this by 100, you should have seen my enthusiasm then. So, um, where were we? He, I said, okay, absolutely. And I said, um, Mr. Gore, I kept calling him Mr. Gore, Mr. Gore. And eventually, at some point, Martin said, oh, it's okay, you you can call me Martin. <laughs> and he did go, <laughs> he never went, ha, ha, ha. I never got that, but I got a few giggles out of him. And I remember showing him some gear at the time. Now, I am, I could shoot myself in the foot because I remember when I sold him the gear, I actually kept the sales invoice with everything. And you guys are probably going to kill me for saying this, but I actually lost that, you know, through the years I've, you know, mo moved into, you know, you move from house to house. And I've lost that and I could kick myself. But anyway, I'm going to try and remember in as much detail as I can, you know, what gear I sold him. But I do remember um, showing him the Roland JV2080. Um, and that was kind of, uh, was it, or what, you know, or was it the XV5080? I can't remember. It could have been the, I, I think it was the xv5080 or the jv80 forgive me i can't remember but it was one of those modules and i remember showing this to him and he was interested and i said yeah you can put you can expand it via srx boards and then i th and i remember thinking at the time is like but you don't want this this is this is full of presets you're supposed to be generating sounds from scratch you're my hero <laughs> and um i just remember he was very interested and then he went he went okay um i'll take it i went okay great and he said, how many expansion slots does it take? I said, well, eight. He says, okay, I'll take eight. I was like, oh, okay. Um, what are the different ones that you need? And he went, well, what do you recommend? I went, well, for you, I think you need the, the latest, uh, the, you know, the latest keyboard sounds, the latest uh, string sounds. And he went, yeah, whatever. So best customer ever. <laughs> you know, he didn't sort of haggle for a discount. He was just like, yeah, bring it on. So I said, okay, put that on the, I had a list with me of all the things he wanted. And I remember, Tay, um, it was also, and then he said, oh, um, you know, what are the, any good keyboards I should know about? And I went, oh, okay. And I remember showing him the, um, the Korg Z1, which is um, sort of like a flagship uh, uh, hybrid synthesis uh, synthesizer. And it was so funny. I remember him, I remember playing it and giving Martin the headphones and he was like, and I went, oh my God, Martin Gore playing the keyboard. And I was like watching his hands, you know, <laughs> as if though it was magical. And then I said, Martin, can, can I ask you a question? And he went, yeah. And I said, did you have piano lessons? And then he looked at his friend. He went, <laughs> no. And I said, uh, did you have singing lessons? And he went, no. I said, oh, so, so you're self-taught, Martin. And he went, yeah, yeah, I I taught it. Yeah, I'm self-taught. And I was getting a bit intense again. So I thought, <sighs> big breath, Vaughn, just, just just back off a little bit. And um, yeah, so I can't remember all the gear I sold him, but I know that he did spend about 7,000 pounds just like that. And he didn't ask the price of anything. He was just like, yeah. And I think he said, yeah, I'll take that. And everything I showed him, he took. And then there was one particular gear, he was, piece of gear he was interested in. And I forget what it was called. I think it was the TC Electronic Firefox or something like that. Now, the TC Electronic Firefox, I'm, I believe it was called that. As I say, don't quote me on this. I haven't checked it up. But it was some kind of multi-effects um, processing unit. And in order for me to demonstrate that, I had to take him and 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 this tall friend of his down the alley to the um, upstairs in the, in, in the pro sales department where we had like a, it was called the media tools. And that's where we took like the very high end customers, not the riffraff <laughs> from the street, <laughs> as we used to call them. I remember in the turnkey days, um, the people that would come in and wouldn't spend many money and just waste your time, we used to re refer to them as time wasters. Remember, you're there trying to make a living and you know, you're very conscious of the fact that, okay, I can only spend so much time with this person. And you became quite blunt because you would, if someone was in there asking questions and if you sensed they weren't going to buy it, you had to kind of say, okay, I'm out of here. I cannot waste my time with this person. So this is the, this is the, the vibe in turnkey. It was very intense. But of course, I was there with Martin Gore and you know, as I said, at the time, it didn't matter that he was spending a lot of money. I was just in such awe to be in his presence. And I remember showing him the, this, demonstrating this um, this TC Electronics module. As I say, I can't remember it. And he went, yeah, I'll take it. I mean, he just he just said yes to everything. I was like, wow, okay. Um, and then I remember taking him down. We, we, we went back into the shop and we went downstairs to the, what we used to call the loop station. That's where we had all 
DJ stuff and beatboxes and stuff. And I was quite amazed that he wanted to look at like these beatboxes. I was thinking, dude, you guys are above, above all that, you know, press play and all that kind of stuff. And But then again, I just got the idea that he, he is obviously very interested in technology and he's he's a geek and you know he's a bit of a fanboy of gear so he likes gear and, and he can afford it and what a great position he's in he just walks in he goes yep yeah, yeah and everything i showed him yep yep yeah, yeah. but there was one interesting thing as well that i remember was i um every time i showed him a piece of gear like when i showed him the jv xv 5080 or the 2080 i can't remember he was interested in that and i said Oh, but you don't need that. You've got one of those already. And he went, no, I don't. <laughs> and then to cut a long story short, every time I showed them a piece of gear, um, not all, not not with every gear, but but there were certain pieces of gear that I'd show him. And I'd go, oh, but you've got one of those. And then Martin looked over it <laughs> and he went to me, how do you know what I've got? And I said, no, no, Martin, because I read an article in Future Music magazine last last month and they were saying your gear list. And I remember Martin saying to me, do you really believe everything you read? <laughs> I just thought, brilliant. But so there's me saying, you know, I, I was just really, man, I was just floating on air at the time. But anyway, sold him a lot of gear. And I did have the chance to, as I say, I did calm down. I, I must have spent about probably an hour to 70 minutes with them. And it was just so nice just you know dealing with a customer that was and and he he was asking my advice for god's sake he was like oh what do you what do you think of this and yeah okay and then i go and he'd be like is it good i go yeah he said okay i'll take it I was like, <laughs> and and i think if i i think if i was a if i was a more um you know money orientated person or you know i think there were certainly some other salesmen there that would have really gone to town with him that you know as i say he's sp he spent about seven thousand pounds but as I say, if I was more shrewd, I could have probably pushed him to spend like 30 grand, you know, because he just, he just didn't, everything I recommended, he went, yeah, I'll have that, I'll have that. And I do remember, you know, it's difficult to remember specific questions. And I, I'm sure I will, you know, make a video on this later. Because what I did want to do is I did want to go down to Charing Cross Road to where Ch Turnkey used to be. And I wanted to film this video there, but I just haven't had the chance. And we may do that sometime. I will get someone to come with me and film and I will just do a, a sort of mini documentary of, you know, where I stood and where I walked. Because I know I know you uh, devotees and geeks in this channel um, cannot get enough of the finer details. So during this mind-blowing experience while I was selling them the gear, I did get a chance to every now and then ask questions that I always wanted to ask. And one of the questions I asked Martin was, Martin, can I ask you something? What are those keyboards you're using on stage? You know, are, are they custom made? You know, this is what I used to think back in those days because their, their, their keyboards, uh, the names were always blanked out. So I always assumed they were like custom made, obviously. And then I remember Martin saying, well, no, they, they're nothing special. They're just basically controller keyboards um, controlling Akai samplers. Now, he specifically said Akai samplers. Um, I was under the impression that they used the emus. I don't know. Um, but he said Akai samplers. And then I... Uh, one of the questions I asked them was uh, asked Martin was what you know what what is it you guys are doing or, or, you know, when you're playing what, what, what I, I know you're playing but th sometimes I can't understand what you're doing and his answer his exact words were to me yeah uh, we have we have the backing on tape and we overdub it live we overdub it live so that to me just means as we know now um, they're playing along a backing uh, backing track and overdubbing it live. Those were his exact words, we overdub it live. What was really funny was, while I was dealing with Martin at, at the time, what really annoyed me was the fact that it, it had been a really quiet week. And the problem with summer in Turnkey was um, a lot of these serious producers and musicians would go away. And, you know, it's tourist season. So we had a lot of tourists coming in then, you know, because it's summer and they'd come in there with their children and they, you know, with their ice creams. And I'm like, don't touch the fucking keyboards, dude. And, and, they, and they're just wasting your time because they're not actually going to buy anything. So summers were quite stressful there. So what really annoyed me was I had, you know, for the past week, I was having a very quiet and a very bad week. And then sod's law at the moment that I've got one of my idols with me 
everyone's trying to get my attention. I could hear my name being called over the intercom. Vaughn, pick up the phone, please. Vaughn, pick up the phone. And I was getting so pissed off. I was like, oh, stop it. I, I, have you guys ever seen Faulty Towers? When Basil Faulty is uh, in the hotel and Lord Melbury walks in and he's just like, he's got no interest in anyone. I'm talking to Lord Melbury. <laughs> it was, I was kind of like that. I was like, I'm talking to Mr. Gore. I was just like, fuck off. Everyone just leave me alone. And it was really sod's law because... As I said, it had been a very quiet week, but now all of a sudden Martin Gore's there. You know, he's spending money. I'm talking to him and now everyone wants my attention. I was like, fuck off, just leave me alone. And <laughs> it was so funny because I remember particularly at the time, there was this nightmare customer. Her name was Mrs. Norris. Uh, she was American. Mrs. Norris, hi there. And I never forget, Mrs. Norris. Now, Mrs. Norris had bought a dust cover for a keyboard and a sustain pedal. So, you know, hardly, you know, the big spender, although as a customer, you should not uh, judge them on that. But she was a nightmare because I remember speaking to her on the phone about this and she went into so much detail. I mean, here I was with Martin Gore and he's just, you know, I'm, I'm selling him pieces of gear that cost, you know, 2,000 pounds a piece. He's like, yeah, I'll take it. But I remember a week previous to that, I had Mrs. Norris on the phone and she's like, could you tell me all about this dust cover? Is it static? Will it hurt my cat if my cat jumps onto the cover? I'm like, keep your pussy off the cover, Mrs. Norris. But anyway. <laughs> so I was on the phone for an hour with this Mrs. Norris. This was a week prior to this. And I was just like, I remember getting off the phone going, oh my God, you know, an hour conversation to sell someone a sustain pedal and a dust cover. Anyway, sod's law, I'm speaking to Martin Gore here and my God, it's Mrs. Norris. Now I'm not exaggerating here. Mrs. Norris had actually phoned up three days prior to this, bearing in mind that she only made this purchase a week ago. She phoned three days prior to this meeting with Martin. She was like, where's my goddamn sustain pedal and dust cover. She was literally like that. And she was a nightmare. And I remember while I was with Martin, I heard this pager going, Vaughn, pick up the phone, Vaughn, pick up the phone. I thought, excuse me, uh, Martin, I need to get this. I went, hello. And it was one of my colleagues saying, Vaughn, I've, I've got this mental woman on the case. Uh, uh, something about a dust cover. Her name's, her name's Mrs. Norris. And I was like, listen, dude, I, fuck, I cannot deal with it now. And he just put her through to me and she was like, hello. I was like, oh, oh, hello. Hello, Mrs. Norris. Vaughn, is that you? I'm like, yes, Mrs. Norris. Any news on my sustain pedal and dust cover for my Yamaha PSR? Blah, 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 whatever. And I was like, um, no, Mrs. Norris, uh, not yet. Well, I've been waiting a long time. Well, with all due respect, Mrs. Norris, you, you, you did place the order, uh, you know, uh, a week ago. It was not, it was 10 days ago. And I was like, oh my God, I said, I was like, just get this woman on the phone. And I, eventually I managed to flush her. But um, yeah, Mrs. Norris, that's another story I'll tell you about. And um, <laughs> We had this joke going around that she was Chuck Norris's mother. <laughs> but anyway, so these distractions kept popping up one at a time. Every and, and, and eventually I just ignored everything. I did spend a good hour to 70 minutes with Martin. Uh, he was a great customer. He just took any, anything that I showed him. He'd go, yeah, I'll take that. And and bear in mind that I think that a lot of, a lot of the equipment that he bought um, you know, didn't necessarily make it onto the Exciter album. And the Exciter album came out in the 14th of March, uh, sorry, the 14th of May, 2001. And that is how I deciphered, because I always said I met Martin in 2000 or 2001, but I'm thinking it must have been the year 2000 because it, it was just before the Exciter came, album came out. And I remember when I listened to the Exciter album, I was trying to go, oh, let, let, me, let me hear if there, if there are any Roland JV uh, presets on that. And of course there weren't. But um, and of course, Martin buying all that gear, you know, Martin's always been in the position, you know, he's privileged, he's, he's made enough money so he can just buy things. He doesn't really have to think about them. Um, so, you know, and, and it... And I did have this feeling of satisfaction thinking when I heard the Exciter album thinking when I sold him some of that stuff, could any of that stuff that I that I sold him, you know, inspire him to, to do any of the sounds or the songs on these albums? I don't know. Um, but it was it was very, very interesting. I remember Martin. Uh, he, he looked really well. Uh, this is think of Martin Gore from the Exciter period. That is exactly how he looked. You know, he had the, the very white teeth. You know, he was tanned. And he, he you know, I remember him wearing like these. Um, those kind of like chucker boots that he wore in um, 
101. You know, and he, he just looked really cool and casual. And he had this really nice silver bracelet and he had like a, like a, like a chain on as well. He just looked really cool. I was just like, fucking hell, dude, you are so cool. And what's interesting is, I've, I've often said this is, and we all understand this sort of intellectually. We understand that people we look up to or stars, we understand that they're just human. We know that intellectually, but it really dawns upon you when you meet someone that you've idolized for so many years. And when they're standing in front of you, you it does dawn upon you that, you know, that he's just a guy. He's, he's just a man. He's just a person. And... Uh, it, it's something you can, as I say, it's something you only really get when you meet someone that you've always looked up to. But it was a very surreal experience. I'm trying to think of as much detail as possible, and some of the details will probably come out of this video. But I just wanted to sort of share that with you. Um, I do remember when we went to the counter, because it was time to pay now. He just, I, I, you know, I said, okay, Martin, that's uh, 7,200 or whatever it was. He went, okay, he just, he just pulled, he just handed over his card. He didn't ask me, he, he wasn't interested. It was just like, yeah. And uh, he paid. And um, I remember him and his friend, you know, walking out of the door. And I was like, wow, oh my God. Uh, you know, if, and, you know, I, I, I remember standing at the door with him and his friend as they were, you know, waiting for a taxi and I remember asking a few questions and here's questions I always wanted to ask and he was very gracious he was uh, he was you know he, just, just just a nice guy it was like talking to a you know some just an old friend he's, he's just really a very kind guy if I look at how this encounter started like when I first met him and I ran and I put this piece of paper in his face you know I could have really scared him off but I'm glad I redeemed myself and sort of went in and explained sorry to freak out um, I'm just a huge fan and I ended up selling him some gear and I think he was very happy and I did get his autograph obviously and I got his autograph again the second time and uh, as I say I had the sales invoice for all the equipment which he purchased which I've un unfortunately lost I've misplaced it because of all the different moves I've made over the years so forgive me I will kick myself for that forever just a little detail that popped up now a tiny detail I remember we were we ended up while we were while I was demonstrating keyboards, I was, uh, we ended up talking about football or something. And Martin was saying something how Sundays, every Sunday they get together and they have a mess around. They, you know, they play football. And I asked him, who do you support? And he said, Arsenal. So anyway, I'm not a football fan. So um, if the fact that Martin Gore is an Arsenal fan pisses you off, don't take it out with me. So jumping back to the part where they paid for everything and I remember putting his address details into the computer and I was thinking, oh, I've got Martin Gore's address now. But he gave me the address of the office, so to speak. And uh, uh, everything was, you know, he, most of the stuff that he purchased was in stock and some of the things weren't, but I had, I, I made sure those were sent to him very promptly uh, the following week when the stock arrived. So they walked out uh, after I bid them farewell and I left and went back to my office and just sat there and I kind of, I remember at one point I just pretended I was on the phone because I just needed, I just needed to zone out. I was like so elated and over the moon. Um, and all of a sudden I heard Vaughn pick up the phone, please. Vaughn pick up the phone. You know it was a, a front of the the shop floor. So I went hello. They said Vaughn, your mate's here again. And I went sorry, your mate is here again. I went who is it? And he said your mate Martin Gore. And I went Martin Gore's here again. And he slammed the phone down. My God, I reckon if you could have timed the speed. That I ran from my office to the front of the front of the office uh, to the front of the shop. I would have kicked Hussein Bolt's ass. I sprinted to the front of the shop, walked in, and Martin Gore was standing in the shop again, and he was at the counter. And when I walked in, he turned around. He went, "Oh, oh, hello!" And I went, "Oh, uh, yeah. Mr. Mr. Gore, M Martin, hi, yes, yes." And he went, and "He said, oh, um, I, did I leave my bag here?" And I went, "Yes, you did." Now, I remember when he came into the shop, he had some kind of really, I forget the shop, but it was really a really posh, it looked like a boutique kind of bag. So he bought something really expensive. And when he came into the shop, he gave it to me because, and he asked me if there's some way I could, you know, put it safe, you know, whilst we were demonstrating the keyboards. But as a result, when he'd left, he'd forgotten it. But this was great because this, this meant he had to come back. And I was like, oh, what can go? I have it all to myself now. And I wasn't rubbing my thighs. I promise you there was nothing sexual about it. I was just over the moon. Uh, yes, yes, uh, yes, Martin. Yes, you you did. Uh, wait there. I, I will get it straight for you. I started. I be, I started becoming quite intense again. 
so I went to the cupboard where I'd kept the bag, got it out, and walked with him to the front of the the um, the shop. And I said, "Oh, um, are you going to get a taxi uh, again?" And he went, "Yeah." And I said, "Okay, I'll go with you." <laughs> he probably thought, "Oh, okay." And I, I get this feeling that Martin doesn't like being alone, um, although he's like a quite yeah you know, quite an introverted person. Um, I, I get the feeling that he he likes. I, I, I just get the feeling I could be wrong that he likes when he goes out, you know, always just to be with someone. So I figured I'd walk out with him and, you know, uh, call a taxi. I mean, I'm really making myself too familiar with him now. So anyway, so I remember us walking over Charing Cross Road and I, I started behave. I started acting like personal security. I was like, OK, let's cross, you know, kind of like <laughs> stopping the traffic. Everyone stop Martin Gore's crossing the road. Yeah, piss off. <laughs> and. I remember walking across the road with him and standing there for about two minutes. And I, in, in those two minutes, um, I was thinking of every question I could ask him. And he answered all the questions. And I remember a taxi coming, a black cab coming. I put my hand up. I said, Martin, taxi. And he went, oh, cheers. The taxi came. It stopped. Opened the door for him. He got in. I gave him his bag. And as he sat down, I went in. I took both... I put my hand out to shake his hand. He he shook my hand. And as he shook my hand, I put the other hand around it. And I said, M I, 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 I don't know if I said mate or Martin, but I just said, thank you so much for everything. You have changed my life in more ways than you could ever know. Thank you so much. And he didn't look freaked out this time because I think he could see, you know, he could see where I was coming from. And he just said, no, thank And he said, no, thank you very much. You've been very helpful. Cheers. And I let go of his hand because <laughs> he's probably thinking I'm going to need that hand back. Gave him his hand back. He got back in, closed the door, and the taxi drove off. And as it drove off, I went like this, and he went, and it just drove off. And I, and I remember watching it as it went down Charing Cross Road. And then at that moment, it just, I, I remember it being a little, I, I, it's, it's funny, this was such a long time ago, but the memory is so vivid, I can remember it. I remember it being a bit quite windy then and maybe a little bit drizzly as well. And I promise you, and I've never told anyone, but at that moment, I kind of stood there and I, I probably looked like a drunk man because I was just a bit like, I was so freaked out. And also the fact that I was, you know, for the last 70 minutes, it's like my adrenaline was pumping and I just had to really keep myself reined in. Um, but I remember at that moment, as he drove away, I remember having a, a little, it wasn't a cry, but it was kind of like a... <sighs> like an overwhelm um and there were tears i can i've never admit i've never admitted this before and i know it sounds lame but i was very young and it was important to me and i was just like <sighs> wow and i crossed the road went back to the office and it's like nothing else mattered because thank you martin you'd made my sales for the you'd raised my sales quota for the last for the next two weeks and i i had no financial worries after that you know for at least the next two weeks but it was a very surreal um encounter um and you know I've, i may have gone a bit overboard with telling the story but um this is me guys um this is how i tell the story and this is how i remember it and um i'm, I'm trying to as i say remember some of the things i asked him but if there's anything of true significance, um, I believe that would have popped to the to the forefront of my mind. But yeah, it was a dream come true. Me, small town boy, meeting one of my heroes. It was a surreal experience. And of course, if I were to meet him again, maybe. Um, yeah, I'd probably not be as well. I'd definitely not behave like that. But it would be it would be an interesting. Uh, uh, meeting to meet him again right guys uh as usual and i always say this my videos are always a lot longer than i intend them to be but um today sunday and on wednesday the 2nd of september i'm going to go and interview gareth jones very excited about that i want to interview him ab about his life a little bit like when i interviewed dave bascombe it was a I did sort of ask the questions that we wanted to know about his life and, you know, to sort of ask the questions that no one's really asked before, or at least the questions that I don't know the answers to. The Gareth Jones video will go up onto my Patreon page, um, you know, just a few days after I interview him. And then about a week after that, it'll come up on um, YouTube as well. 
Guys, if this is your first time to my channel, I would like to welcome you with open arms. And if I haven't scared you away, I would be very grateful if you'd hit the like and the subscribe button because that really helps me a lot. Please also join the Vaughan George Facebook group. It's a fantastic group, if I do say so myself. Definitely one of the best Facebook groups I've been on. And and, and that's, that, that's, that's not my saying it. That's not me saying it. Speak to the community. It's a great positive community. Jump on there. Um, there's a few questions to answer and my admins will um, allow you access. Um, I'm on Twitter. I'm on Instagram. I want to thank my patrons for your loyal support as always. And leave your comments in the description below. Have you met Martin Gore before? Have you met Fletch? Have you met Dave? Have you met Alan? We'd love to hear your stories. We'd love to talk about this and elaborate on this. And as I say, this is why we have the Vaughan George Facebook group is, is, is so we can elaborate and talk about these videos in, in, in sort of like a, for, in like a forum kind of setting. That's it from me, guys. I hope you have a fantastic day. Take care of yourselves, and I look forward to seeing you on the next video. Adios.